So James, what inspired you to create an exhibition around the Tasmanian tiger? Um, I guess it came from the initial invitation to put a submission together for the Stardust series. And I wanted to come up with an idea that had a sort of broad interest and application and a relevance to Tasmanian culture, but also related to work I'm interested in making. Um, and, and for me, I'm really interested in a kind of blurring lines or boundaries between fact and fiction and often using documentary strategies to explore those spaces. And so I haven't done anything about the thylacine before. I don't know anything about the thylacine, but it felt like um, an aspect of Tasmanian culture that was pretty rich for mining and that I thought fitted really well with this exhibition um, structure. So that, that's how I started and then it really went from there. So what kind of research did you, did you do to, um, to come up with the, the stories from the community about the tiger and the mythology surrounding that? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, um, to have a series of conversations in the exhibition and to sort of mine you know, people's experiences from all different perspectives and that wasn't easy. I think I presumed it was going to be easier than it ended up being. So luckily I had a few points of contact, so Catherine, Catherine Medlock in um, the museum and also a friend, um, a friend of the family, uh, Nick Mooney, who has great experience with um, all aspects of, of thylacine culture and stories and people and, and so these people were a great starting point that gave me some names and, and places to go and start to try to find people but I found there was a fair bit of secrecy and a little bit of um, hesitation to speak to someone that you know they've had no experience with before about a, a subject they're really passionate about and that has been ridiculed or is sensitive in a lot of ways so it wasn't something where I could just kind of rock up and um, meet people and get you know talking straight away and put a camera in front of their face. So I wanted the interviews to be quite um, specific in terms of the people I spoke to. So it took a few months to, to make contact. And you know, for example, one person actually contacted um, the TMAG first to ask about me and whether I was for real and legit before um, he then replied to my email. Um, and then he was really generous. But there was that element of secrecy and, and suspicion, which is understandable, but I had to work through that. A lot of your, um, your previous work, it, it really goes into that sort of personal storytelling. Um, do you find it's, how do you find that you go about reflecting people's personalities through the work that, that you do with, with film? Um, I think the most important thing is, is time. So few people are happy to have, to meet you and have a camera, you know, pointed at their face. And, and to talk to it. <laughs> no, it's quite intimidating. A camera becomes a barrier between you and the person. And if you have no existing relationship with them, it's really hard just to get straight to that point where you're recording something that they're giving, which is quite personal. So I guess it's about building relationships and giving time um, and building trust as well. And that, you know, sometimes that stuff sounds like cliches a little bit, but without trust, then there's never going to be a genuine kind of engagement there. And, and there's going to be a level of kind of suspicion, which is totally understandable because you wouldn't just walk, walk up to someone in the street and expect them to give all, you know, straight away as soon as they met you, especially to a camera. So, yeah, time and trust. And I think another thing, you know, when I was speaking to people, some of the people I interviewed had had slightly negative experiences with other media where they felt like their stories were maybe manipulated or taken out of context. So I explained that being working as an artist, I didn't have an agenda where it was about providing a little 30-second grab that would be presented as kind of mass-consumed um, news you know, headlines. It was something that wanted to kind of maybe, as an artist, you want to probe deeper and you can allow time for other stories to emerge. And within this exhibition, it's not just about thylacine, it's about environment, conservation, politics, economy, all these other things. So, you know, opened up broader conversations. You photographed yourself some thylacine material in two or three different museums. How did you find that, I guess, as being a Tasmanian and knowing that, you know, this is the remnants of what was from, from now extinct animal, but also um, how, how do you feel that adds to, that th those historical materials add to the exhibition as a whole? Yeah. Well, I was when I found out that I w was accepted, that the proposal was accepted as part of Stardust, um, I was actually overseas on a scholarship travelling, um, and I was in Berlin, um, and my girlfriend actually made 
me aware, she went to the Berlin Natural History Museum and said, you've got to go because there's a Tasmanian wolf there, um, you know, which is a common term for the thylacine, but it was just also that thing of it being massively taken out of context. Um, and even for me, you know, I always knew it as a Tasmanian tiger, that, that being referred to as a Tasmanian wolf seemed to be out of context, but in fact it's probably more correct than calling it the tiger. So um, that was really interesting to have this idea, which I guess is really localised, um, but being in a totally different place in the world and, and seeing connections starting to emerge. And this thing that has been kind of kept as a museum object, and it just has this melancholy about it, and seeing it in this beautiful museum in Berlin kind of increased that melancholy. It was kind of incredible. You know, it's kind of like a theatrical stage, you know, these kind of um, dioramas and wunderkammers and stuff. And then I also, I didn't see one in New York, but um, in the American Museum of Natural History, seeing how natural history is presented, I guess kept on reiterating that idea of... Um, how the museum's importance in terms of collecting artefacts, objects, natural history, and presenting them as stories or experiences, and, and that made me kind of think about using the diorama in the exhibition, and, and that the exhibition is within a museum context, where it's a museum that doesn't just show art, but also shows you know, sci scientific objects and, and other things like this. So, um, yeah, I guess it started to come together and having the six months away was a nice um, distance to think about the project and then when I came back I was really keen to include some of that stuff in the exhibition to demonstrate how this thing has become a myth that's spread throughout the world and that's no kind of under, you know, exaggeration, it really does permeate. Um, so I, I'm unfamiliar with your previous film work but I haven't seen your work as installation before. Was this a new experience to be combining the, your, your filmic work with other elements and things like that or is it something that you're um, that you've done consistently before in your work? Um, I've done I've definitely you know when I, I predominantly make video works mm -hmm. And um, it's never just about the video, it's about the space it's shown in. And so I always consider the space, and I guess I always work with space. Um, and I've, you know, worked in, in, in a sort of a capacity of installation before, but never with dioramas and not on this scale before. So it was a great new experience. It was a real privilege to be able to use the museum's existing diorama that um, Brian Luca um, made. You know, what I wanted to do is set up an interesting relationship between the three-dimensional elements in the, in the show, the actual space, so even the fact the gallery is dark and it's sort of a sense of discovery that happens, and the videos, and then intertwining that through surveillance cameras and video, you know, live feed loops and things like this. So it all starts to overlap and it's new but it's expanded on things that I've, I've done before. Developing the show I had, you know, so many kind of ideas for possible works going on while I was also filming and developing works and they kept on changing and changing and kept changing um, and expanding and then it's a matter of contracting them down so what I've done is present you know as well as the interviews and the images and the diorama these two video works one revolves around a story where someone talks about a sighting and then becomes contradicted and the whole thing leaves a question mark open. The other work's silent it's sort of like a series of vignettes and I've worked in this kind of video portrait portrait portraiture capacity before um, but I wanted like I almost imagined creating like this sort of um, it's it's almost like a tragic kind of um, pathetic like kind of love story between these two characters and they're, they're both anonymous characters and I actually originally had um, a script that was based on an Elton John um, kind of popular song that was really kind of pathetic and tragic but, but, but kind of genuine and real as well about seeking and wanting Anyway, I paired all that stuff back. So you've got this figure of a bushman, a trapper, this kind of lonely trapper. He's kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a, an icon that exists that is still anonymous. And then you've got this other anonymous figure of the thylacine, which is ridiculous because it's in a suit, but it's a beautiful suit. Um, and they're kind of, there's an interaction that happens, but there's no conversation. They kind of look for each other. They never find each other. And I guess the idea of the thylacine being in this beautiful interior, um, which was filmed specifically in the Astor Hotel in Hobart because it really kind of relates to that period of history, it's kind of like, you know, it exists in our mind now. And, and everywhere this person's looking, it's not there. And actually being out in the landscape and looking around, you feel like there's potential that anything could be there, but it's just void, there's nothing there. And then this character that he's looking for is a kind of imagined ridiculous character which is now in our minds in this interior environment, um, sleeping and, and kind of lost in a way. So it's, it's sort of, it's melancholic, it's sad, it's pathetic um, and it provides a backdrop for the exhibition.
the exhibition also has just that a aspect of um, engaging a broader public and the public pro programs and how that works. So I guess another thing about you know looking at the thylacine is, as I said, it's got this really interesting. It exists in an interesting space between fact and fiction. It's a it's a myth, um, but it's something that you know every Tasmania has a sense of ownership of, whether. Um, that's even just an opinion or whether it's direct experience from a past family member who may have seen something or heard of something. So I think it, hopefully the exhibition creates a space where people can contribute to it. And, and that gets talked about, about a lot in art, but I really think that it's an open exhibition where nothing's confirmed. Um, and there's opportunity for people to actually um, fill in these forms and contribute their own stories or memories. Um, and, and hopefully it creates a conversation that continues. So in terms of how the public interact, I really hope that in direct and indirect ways, it just keeps the conversation going, which is about speculation. And it's not about this is right or this is wrong. It's about the possibility of something, but all the things and the ripples and the ramifications around that, as I said, even if that's environmental, political, it's conversations that need to keep happening. And so hopefully it's a, a starting point for that stuff and that people will engage with that.